The battle for control of Venezuela rages on following opposition leader Juan Guaido's calls for continued protests in the streets of Caracas in the hopes of overthrowing current Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. Both men claim to be its rightful leader. It is both a political and a humanitarian crisis that's been playing out over several years now, with many Venezuelans fleeing their homeland for places like Florida in search for safety and stability. With South Florida's strong ties to Latin America, what problems could the unrest in Venezuela pose for politics and business here? Joining me now to help break it all down and the latest for us in Venezuela is Richard Tapia, professor of political science and international relations at Miami-Dade College. Professor, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's talk about this latest situation. We really saw the unrest break out violent unrest in Caracas this Tuesday of this week. We have Guaido trying to get his supporters to come out and eventually overthrow Maduro. We haven't seen that happen yet. So kind of lay the land for us of what's going on here. Well, what is taking place here is that Guaido decided to do a final push to try to restore the constitutional process of having the National Assembly president become the president who's now accepted and legitimized by the Lima Group, which is a group of 12 countries within the Organization of American States that recognizes Guaido as the legitimate president. In the case of Maduro, Maduro believes that he's the legitimate president because he decided to basically hold elections that the international community does not recognize as legitimate free and fair elections in which he won the outcome of that election. So now what you have are two heads of state in Venezuela. One, Guaido, that is supported by the National Assembly, supported by the Group of 12, which is the Lima Group, and also supported by the United States and the European Union. And then you have Nicolas Maduro, who is recognized by Russia, China, and Cuba. Now, the question is, how did we get to this point where we have two heads of state? And it goes all the way back to 2015, when the National Assembly, the opposition, won two-thirds of the seats in the National Assembly. In an attempt to hold on to power, you're going to see that what ended up happening was that President Nicolas Maduro basically suspended the National Assembly, created a National Constituent Assembly in which he got to basically begin to appoint the members of that assembly and then call for elections to electing those members. Now, many observers have called this to be very unconstitutional. First of all, the reason he was able to create a National Constituent Assembly is because he vacated many of the members of the Supreme Court and then appointed new members of the Supreme Court that later legitimized his move to push for a National Constituent Assembly, which is very different from their Congress, which is the mm -hmm. National Assembly. Mm -hmm. Now, he also called for a referendum to elect members into the National Constituent Assembly, which was also unconstitutional, because in order to call for a National Constituent Assembly, you need a referendum before you call for it, which is what actually Will Chavez did in 1999 prior to basically calling the Constituent Assembly. So what we see here is a lack of stability, and in the meantime, we see this once very oil-rich country Correct. sinking into despair. I mean, we've all seen the pictures on television of people literally going through the trash looking for food. We've seen the shelves at the grocery store empty. People don't have basic medication. So this is a huge humanitarian crisis, is it not? Absolutely. Four million refugees have now left Venezuela. It's one of the largest refugee populations in the world, comparable to that of Syria the largest in the American continent, 3 million of them living in Colombia, 300,000 seeking asylum in the United States, two-thirds of them in South Florida alone. And they don't have temporary protected status by the administration. So what you begin to see is that many, many of these individuals are going to find themselves in an area within the law where they're visiting, they come visiting as tourists, they seek asylum, but they're not given protected status and they're in danger of becoming undocumented. So this becomes a major problem especially as the economy continues to collapse in Venezuela. Hyperinflation, according to the IMF, is going to reach probably 10 million percent. Oh. 10 million percent. Here in the United States, inflation is 2 to 3 percent. So 10 million percent means the complete collapse of the economy, and the government of Venezuela continues to print money in order to try to pay off some of its debt. Because what's happened is that they've spent so much money to maintain many social programs mm -hmm. that are now basically unsustainable because the price of oil has dropped from $100, barrel, $100 a barrel to $33 a barrel in, in 2016. Now it's back up to $50. But production continues to drop because they have mismanaged the main production and the main uh, company 
of oil, which is the PDVSA within Venezuela. So it's a complete collapse of the economy. It's a catastrophe. Give us some sense of how, of what could happen next. There's several different types of scenarios, but it seems like to get back to the way they were would be a really long haul, would it not? Correct. There's three possibilities of what could take place. Now, Guaido mobilized, hoping that the military, under the leadership of the defense minister, Padrino, would switch sides and come to his aid, and in which case he takes the presidential palace. It's legitimized by the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he begins to receive international aid. They, first of all, they have to rebuild the central bank. The dollars in the central bank has been looted by the regime. This has become a kleptocracy where they have literally stolen the money from mm -hmm from the central bank using a preferable exchange rate only available to the to the head of the regime, to the chiefs of the regime, to the generals, to, let's say, the head of the uh, private guard, the presidential guard, which People is a People who surround one. and support Maduro. Correct. That surround and support Maduro are able to get an exchange of, let's say, 10 to 1 on their currency, where everybody else, their money has become completely worthless. Now, that has caused the central bank to be com completely depleted of all dollars. Mm -hmm. So now you have to extend lines of credit. You have to, if a Guaido transition takes place, you have to rebuild the central bank. You have to extend lines of credit to be able to bail out not just the Venezuelan central bank, but just to begin to do a currency exchange and create a new currency within Venezuela. You have to basically open it up to imports because part of the problem in Venezuela is that they don't allow imports. They don't even allow humanitarian aid mm -hmm. to basically assist the people that are starving to death well, in Venezuela. We saw how there was humanitarian aid that was right there on the border between Venezuela and Colombia and they were not letting it in, they weren't provided by in. the United States. Correct, and they were even seizing the shipments and destroying the shipments of humanitarian aid to help feed the people of Venezuela. So a, a continue a complete restructuring of the economy of Venezuela is going to need to take place under Guaido if Guaido comes to power. Now, there's another possibility that Guaido does not come to power. Maduro is able to hold on because he has support by Cuba. 20,000 Cuban troops are present. Russia has also sent troops. The number of troops are unknown at the moment by the Pentagon on how many Russians have arrived to basically support Maduro. Are these Russian regular forces? Are they irregular forces like we saw in Syria? We also don't know the extent in which the Chinese have provided support. And the question is, why would the Russians and the Chinese and the Cubans provide such support? Mm -hmm. is because Venezuela owes large amounts of money to Russia and to China. Out of $100 billion of the total debt of Venezuela, over half of that is owed to Russia and to China. About $20 billion worth of collateralized debt to the Russians, in which in exchange, the Russians have controls of some of their oil fields, half of Sitco, another $9 billion worth of investments that the Russians don't want to lose. The Chinese have another $20 billion that they don't want to lose. So for those for those countries to begin to switch over to Guaido, they have to be guaranteed their investments. Otherwise, that's not that's not a, a real possibility of them switching over yeah. to Talk Guaido. Talk, too, about possible American military intervention. We actually heard Correct. John Bolton talk about that publicly. Even yeah. Senator Rick Scott talked about supporting some sort supporting. of U.S. military intervention. What would that look like? What, what that would look like, according to the Brookings Institute and, and looking at the Pentagon, that would basically to bring stability to a country of about 39 million to 40 million people. You're talking about 150,000 troops being present in Venezuela, whether they be American troops, Brazilian, Colombian, or coalition with the Lima group going in to restore order. You also have to take into consideration that Maduro does have Cuban troops, has former members of the FARC, has Russian troops, has Russian troops present as well. You also have groups of colectivos, which are irregular forces that are loyal to Maduro. And you may end up having a low intensity conflict with American forces or coalition forces over an extended period of time. So that's a real possibility that you're looking at if the United States decides to take the military route. Now, right now, what you have is a game of chicken between Mm. the Trump administration and the Russian Federation and whether or not they really believe that the Americans are going to commit ground troops or going to commit a military intervention. Part of what you're beginning to see within Venezuela that you see that the Russians are poking their finger at the eye of the Americans is, is kind of trying to call the bluff of the Trump administration. Are you really willing to commit 150,000 troops into Venezuela and overextend yourself when you have issues in Libya, in Iraq, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan? Can America risk getting involved in another protracted conflict over a long period of time? And even have support from the American people for something like that. Correct. Yeah. So.
As a professor, quickly, and we're running out of time, what are your students saying? I'm sure you have many students in your classes who are from Venezuela. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we, have, we have students that are very intrigued, and even when we're talking about comparative European government, they see a lot of the parallels that's taking place within Latin America, within Venezuela, and they begin to ask many questions on what, what, what are some scenarios for reconstruction, economic reconstruction, after a, a post-Maduro regime. We also wow. had the honor of having Ambassador Carlos Vecchio wow. come to our classroom. He is the appointed ambassador by President Guaido here in the United States, yeah. and I've had the pleasure of being in a few panels with him, and he basically talks about how this transition would look like, how did we get to this point. Yeah. So it's, it's a very good time for students to be involved in politics Absolutely. because there's a lot to talk about. Messy situation, and we'll see Guaido's calling for more protests this weekend, so we'll have to see how that all plays Absolutely. out. Professor, thank you so much. We appreciate you your insight me. and your expertise.